My name is Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy, and I am the son of Mary Elizabeth Jones Brayboy. She was the daughter of Rose Bell McMillan Jones and Zelma Sampson Jones. She was also the daughter of McKinley Jones Sr. I'm also the son of Bobby Dean Brayboy, and he's the son of Eva Harris Brayboy and Tecumseh Brian Brayboy II. Um, when my parents decided to have children, they, they made a deal early on before they started trying. If they had a girl, my mom would name them. If they had a boy, my father would name them. And um, of course, um, much to my mother's chagrin, they had three boys. <laughs> so my father named me, and people will often say to me, you've got such a long name, it's such a mouthful. And I say to them, I'm named after my grandfathers, McKinley Jones Sr. and Tecumseh Brian Brayboy II. Thank you. I come from this small community in North Carolina called Prospect. When I was growing up, it was population 123. There was a flashing yellow light. It flashed yellow on all four sides. Um, people just knew to slow down or to turn your lights off and keep going and hope for the best. <laughs> um, and generally, that, that tended to work out. And there was a small sign um, on the northeast corner of, of Cozy Corner, which is where the, the light was, it said, Welcome to Prospect, population 123, cradle of Indian country. Um, now when you go through, that sign has been replaced. There's a four-way stop. Unfortunately, it's not as much fun. Um, and it says, Welcome to Prospect, population 893, cradle of Indian prosperity. Um, it's changed a bit, but I was thinking about the superintendent's remarks. I'm going off script here a little bit, but I grew up in a house with no running water and electricity. And the U.S. government gave my father some round trip tickets to Vietnam. Um, and he came back and um, he was really good at throwing a baseball. So he went to college and he got a degree and not long after we got running water and electricity. It is the most fundamental basic way for me to explain to people why I care about school. It changed my life. From not having to haul water from the river, from not having to use an outhouse, from being in a place when cold wind in north, southern, southeastern North Carolina blew through wood that didn't fit all the way together and we were cold and huddled up. It literally changed my life. And I am both um, somewhat appalled by and really proud that my children will never know that, that existence, right? Because what we want is for them to do better. Um, and I think that's what you all want, is for your children to do better and to have different opportunities. So I'm also the father of two boys, um, along with a lovely spouse named Doris Warner. And, um, in the top corner here is Quana McKinley Warner Brayboy, and to his right is his brother Ely Tecumseh Warner Brayboy. Um, they are rising seniors and rising sophomore in, in high school. Quana will know where he's going to college relatively soon because, like his grandfather, he's really good with a ball. It just happens to be a soccer ball. So he's weighing offers now and he's going to try to figure out where he's going. So, um, and Ely is in his. Uh, um, headed that way too. This is a photo of myself and Jeremiah Chin, who I will come back to, Jeremiah, but I recruited Jeremiah to the University of Utah when I was a faculty member there. He was 17 years old, and he was that tall. Um, and he was the most incredible young man. The application, I sort of read it and I thought, I gotta work with this guy. Um, and so it's now 15 years later 17 years later, and, um, and we're working together, and I'm presenting on some work that we're doing. Jeremiah has a, a JD and a PhD, and he just passed the bar. Uh, he's a pretty remarkable, remarkable guy. So I start with my family, and, and in some ways, Jeremiah is part of my family because I really want to think both about who makes me, me better, but I also want to think about and emphasize the theme of your meetings, which I really appreciate, called Humanizing Education Through Transformative Curriculum. And to me, this really speaks to the important message that we must find ways to build, strengthen, maintain, and nurture students' past, presence, and potentials 
connecting them to broader social and cultural contexts. The humanizing experience is key to transforming society since there's no one-size-fits-all solution to the many problems we face. We can emphasize shared humanity and difference at the same time. We do this in part by using coalitional work to identify our unique context and how they might be connected across time and space to identify sources of oppression and potential for change. So in this talk, I want to focus on two key points. First, that structural oppression, i.e. white supremacy and colonization, cannot be addressed one-dimensionally. And second, coalitions are critical to undermining white supremacy. We must avoid the seduction of the structures and structures that may reward our individual or our group efforts while ignoring the plight of others or perpetuate the zero-sum game ideology that narrows success to one at a time piecemeal results. By structure, I'm not talking just about institutions here, but larger systematic oppression like white supremacy, colonization, patriarchy, heteronormativity, and other forms of oppression, all of which are intimately linked and interlocking. When I'm talking about white supremacy and colonization, I don't want to lose sight of the ways that these are related to different forms of oppression that marginalize particular bodies, particular peoples, lands, and ways of being and knowing. But among these varied ways of speaking about oppression as a structure, what we see is that violence and fear are primary features. Let me just stop because I got sort of caught up and mo so moved by your superintendent's remarks that what I didn't do is really acknowledge the peoples of these lands. And I, I, at the risk of getting into a, um, having people come up and sort of tell me that I've missed stuff, as I understand it, these are, are both Oatham and Pasquayaki lands, and I suspect there are other folks who lay claims to these here, and I want to recognize the fact that I am absolutely a visitor in this space. More than a historical moment, white supremacy is colonial violence embedded into the very existence of the U.S. To be clear, by white supremacy, I don't mean the existence and role of hate groups, although they're important. What I mean here is an often prevailing mindset and the resulting realities that suggest that the narratives and stories that matter, that the structures which frame our work, livelihoods, neighborhoods, schooling, and governance is rooted in the notion of supremacy that rewards particular ways of being and doing. These structures are often inhabited predominantly by white actors, not always, who fall back on tropes of meritocracy to explain their positioning rather than recognizing the role of history and access to capital that may have created easier ascent for them than it did for their brown brothers and sisters. My thinking is that white supremacy and the interlinked forms of oppress oppressive violence relies on placing peoples in silos, separating issues, ideas, and the peoples connected to them to ensure the preeminence of white supremacy. If there's a challenge to white supremacy, the system benefits from that resistance being isolated, avoiding connection to others, people who may identify with the oppressed, and other struggles and other issues. In education, this means drawing on particular kinds or forms of culturally responsive schooling to connect with students. Culturally responsive schooling has over the years come to mean, and I appreciate the superintendent's re remarks about this, it has come over the years, however, to mean that the curriculum for content and pedagogy or how we think about teaching and learning are centered around materials and teachings for a particularly racialized and or ethnic group. It may be that we do CRS for African American students or for Mexican American or Latino students. This is important and meaningful work and certainly falls within the framework of how CRS or culturally responsive schooling has been constructed and I support it. In fact, I've written extensively about it and engaged in the work in my own practices. I'm invested in its success. Today, however, I want us to think and consider what CRS might look like when we take an additional step to making connections across cultural context, linking the CRS designed for one audience to different peoples, places, and points of views. In many ways, I think that this work that those who are proponents of CRS are doing are already beginning to do this. I want to add my voice to supporting these efforts 
what we might ask is, what are the possibilities when we, what are the possibilities when we consider the range and variations of groups around a particular phenomenon? Consider the ways in which people are targeted by white supremacy, like the purges of voter rolls in Georgia, which disproportionately disenfranchised black voters. This in the light of the amazing candidacy of Stacey Abrams, who was almost and likely should have been the first black woman elected governor of a state. Almost 150 years after the passage of the 15th Amendment, ensuring a vote cannot be denied on account of race. Almost 100 years since the 19th Amendment, ensured a vote cannot be denied on the basis of sex. A little over 50 years since the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And just five years since the Supreme Court gutted the same Voting Rights Act in 2015, we're looking at the same types of voter suppression and disenrollment in Georgia. But it isn't just Georgia. Since the Supreme Court declined last year to take the case of North Dakota's voter ID laws that systematically denied natives the right to vote since they lack valid residential street addresses because most of us in rural communities use P.O. boxes, Imagine the fact that indigenous peoples who have lived in the land since time immemorial, who only gained the right to vote in 1924, and it was almost 95 years ago to the day, last week was the 95th anniversary of this, are now being told they cannot vote because the reservations in which they live has only P.O. boxes for addresses. How do we talk about these issues as related more than by the right to vote, but also by the maintenance of white supremacy? What is erased or elided in the process of not making these connections? Who is harmed and to what ends are they harmed? Similar tactics, different places, related strategies with the same ultimate goal, maintaining white supremacy. How, I, how might we illustrate the connections between white supremacy, violence, erasure, land, and indigeneity? I'm going to start with an illustration. Some of you all may know this, know this lithograph. It's John Gass' work called American Progress. It was later produced in travel guides as a chromolithi chromolithograph, which is a process where the artist adds color to reproductions of drawings or photographs on metal slides. Popular in the 19th century, Gast was a Brooklyn-based artist commissioned by George Crowfoot, who published a series of travel guides for people venturing west American Progress, which is the name of this, might be considered an early travel advertisement, a way of spreading propaganda of westward expansion and encouraging adventure. As a white artist interpretation of the US, United States push to colonize the western part of North America. Gast work is historically significant, though not particularly historically accurate. The running of the railroad, laying of telegraph wires, Wagon trains, buffalo herds moving westward. Groups of people who appear to be land speculators or homesteaders, stagecoaches. Several tribal groups, one of which appears to be running away from Columbia. That large white version is called Columbia, which signifies progress. Native peoples are running away from progress. A physical embodiment of the land. And in some cases, progress as she moves from New York into what might be the Rocky Mountains. So why should we care about a chromolithograph from 147 years ago? I don't think it's particularly aesthetically pleasing or factually accurate. But what I do care about and what is absolutely important for me are the ideas underlying the art. As depicted by Gast, American progress accurately represents how the colonization of the US is rooted in erasure. Gas paints over and erases indigenous peoples from New York where the Lenape lived, nurtured, and were nurtured by the island of Manhattan and other parts of the region. Gas replaces the Lenape and their sister tribal nations with white colonizers and the artifacts of their progress, which are represented by cities, bridges, and roads. The imagery conjures progress in imagination and excitement for particular kinds of travelers while indigenous peoples are fleeing progress, or they are in the midst of some kind of dance that on the plains, out on the plains, oblivious to progress emerging around them. The idea in both the image and in the American imaginary literally calls for progress 
to overrun and override Native peoples, erasing them from the page and from the future of American progress. These days they wear suits and sneakers. This erasure is a common trope of the 19th century. It began two centuries prior to the chromolithograph and continues into today. Unlike the indigenous peoples depicted by Gast, native peoples proved to be formidable and not easily moved. Railroads and telegraph lines did not magically appear from some floating white woman, but were built on labor of exploited and marginalized peoples from Asian immigrants who were legally banned from immigrating in the Chinese Exclusion Act to enslaved and freed African Americans and Mexican traqueros. White progress, much like property in the US, is created on the backs of black and brown labor over red lands while erasing all non-white contributions. <clears throat> this relationship between progress and erasure informs the past and the present, and I suspect it will also inform the future. How might we stop erasure? How might we consider ways to build coalitions that address these erasures and unlock images and imagery into the minds of our students? The erasure itself is both a policy and a practice of white supremacy, but importantly, it functions in tandem with other forms of violence, physically, practically, rhetorically, and historically. Gast work depicts progress and movement, but even taken at face value, it papers over the role of violence associated with this progress. Peoples have to be removed from lands. Enslaved peoples, freedmen, immigrants, and poor whites are then stuck building the roads and the railways and housing. This isn't done because people need work. It happens through violence. Literally, railways and progress happens one violent act at a time. One of the points I want to make is that violence and progress are inextricably linked and that the violence and progress is embedded in colonization, which to borrow from Patrick Wolfe is a structure and not an event. It framed westward movement and it continues to frame engagements with peoples of color. But these questions are never simply about resistance. There are costs. We've also succumbed, many of us and our relatives have succumbed to physical and symbolic violence. What's crucial, however, in addressing these histories is noting that they are plural. White supremacy relies on placing peoples, along with their challenges, struggles, and achievements, in silos, making us singular, in a sense, in order to maintain its foothold in our structure and systems. Just to be clear here, when I talk about white supremacy, I am talking about structures and systems. I am not talking about people. This is not me saying that anyone with white skin is bad. It is me saying that our systems and our structures are built towards particular ends. I want to be really, really clear about that because this is hard stuff to hear and people don't often like me talking about violence. Whether it is physical violence or rhetorical violence or symbolic violence, but when you erase people, when you forget their histories, when you stop remembering what was there before you were, you are in fact committing forms and acts of violence. And I wanna just be really clear about that so that folks aren't going, why is this guy attacking us? It's not about that. This is fundamentally about my five-year-old self whose father got a shot at education, who had an opportunity to go to college, who changed my life because someone believed in him. And that is part of your work, is to believe in the children in front of you. Part of what I want to argue, I'm sorry, that was a little off script, but I'm, feeling, I'm sort of feeling myself at the moment. Part of what I want to argue today following the theme of this conference is that we, human, we humanize education to transform society when we build, strengthen, maintain, and nurture coalitional work. We must reduce the seduction of the structures that may reward our individual or our group efforts while ignoring the plight of others. So today I want to introduce you to a concept that Jeremiah and I have introduced you to Jeremiah earlier, been working on for the past few years. We noticed that the ways that people have been engaged by the US, both historically and in the present moment, was through a series of violent acts and fear. In the early days of the US, people were literally being removed from the lands. This was a moment in which deterritorialization happened. 
People were removed from the lands, the histories of this removal, and the brutality of the violence. The sheer terror it created was glossed over behind phrases like trail of tears. The gloss hides and erases the terror, fear, and violence. So we landed on this concept that we're calling territory. And territory is a blend or a portmanteau of terrorism and territory. Territory re-examines and reframes the federal definition of terrorism as, and I'm quoting here, this is a federal definition, the unlawful use of force or violence against peoples or property to intimidate or coerce in furtherance of political and social objectives, end quote to focus instead on the relationship between land and peoples, highlighting when fear or violence are lawfully, as opposed to unlawfully, are lawfully used against persons to maintain a colonial dominance over property. The fact that we're addressing, what we're addressing here is legal is really important. What does it mean to explore and examine the lawful use of terror? Territory's primary interest is one of justice by exposing legality. And the early taking of lands was not only legal, but it was also sanctioned and even endorsed by the government. People were paid to kill the savage, thereby removing them from the lands, clearing way for the expansion of white supremacy, the state, and economy. But the narrative doesn't end with westward expansion. It continues today in Standing Rock, in Flint, Michigan, and in the borderlands of Mexico and Arizona. The structures that uphold and promulgate white supremacy are legal. We know, of course, that what's legal and what is just are not the same things. As much of this started as a conversation about land and indigenous peoples, the ways indigenous lands have been treated as inseparable from race and inseparable from racism. Exploring the connections between race, land, and indigeneity helps us explain larger questions of who belongs, who matters, what stories matter, and who should be in charge of their own futures. So we're left asking, what might happen if we build coalitions to address seemingly unrelated challenges and broken structures? How can coalitions engage in humanizing education by making cross-cultural connections while remaining grounded and culturally relevant for the intended audience? To do this with the rest of my time, I'd like to connect three recent examples of territory to underscore the importance of coalitional work. It's a fairly basic point, but its implementation is not. It requires deliberation, coordination, and communication. In order for communi communities of color and the scholars they birth to make any headway in the plethora of challenges we face, we must do so together. That is, we must form coalitions and engage in coalitional work. Responding to individual challenges must be transformed into responding to connected challenges. When we focus solely on things in front of us, they are pertinent to us and our groups we fall into a trap. The trap is institutional barriers and structures like white supremacy rely on siloed approaches. This is not just true of racialized responses as I wanna argue, but it's also true of methodological and theoretical ones as well. So what does this look like in practice? I wanna provide you with three examples that revolve around water in the lives of American Indian, African American, and Latino Latina peoples, as is the case with the previous examples noted above, all of the actions on the part of the government appear to be legal, or at least temporarily sanctioned. These examples of territory highlight the structure of white supremacy and how it reaches into different communities with different effects, but with the same goal. I wanna start in Standing Rock, North Dakota with the Dakota Access Pipeline, or DAPL. In 2016, indigenous peoples and others from across the US, frankly the world, gathered in solidarity with Standing Rock Sioux to stop the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline, an 1,100-mile pipeline built by the Texas-based corporation Energy Transfer Partners that would transport oil extracted from North Dakota to a port in Illinois where it would then go down the Mississippi River to Texas to be worked through and refined. The route of the pipeline passed near water sources of the Standing, Wa Standing Rock Reservation through lands sacred to Lakota peoples. The pipeline had already been rerouted away from the predominantly capital, from the predominantly white capital of North Dakota, Bismarck, 
because of its proximity to drinking water in that city and region. The citizens of Bismarck rightfully objected to having a pipeline so close to their homes for fear that it might contaminate drinking water and any leaks might damage livestock and farming areas. Water protectors gathered to stop the pipeline from being built through direct action. State police and a paramilitary private security force hired by energy transfer partners set out to disrupt and end demonstrations, deploying dogs to scare, police bite, terrorize, and discipline the water protectors. Security and police shot protesters with rubber bullets, in some cases maiming and crippling them, and later they used water cannons in sub-zero freezing temperatures to deter the water protectors from engaging in protests. The protectors were, their water protectors were physically and legally forced from demonstration areas and construction was completed in April of 2017. The pipeline would spring two leaks shortly before its official opening, continuously pumping oil across lands and the waterways of indigenous peoples. What has not been discussed enough in this process is that while the pipeline is not technically on tribal lands, these are lands held as sacred by members of Standing Rock. Their ancestors are buried in parts of this area. They collect sacred medicines from the space and they have long held ceremonies here. Treaties are intended to protect not just reservation lands, but those lands that native peoples use as hunting and fishing grounds. This notion has been extended to the gathering of medicines so that the idea that, the viol that violate, this violated the terms of the treaty cannot be overlooked. These rights are erased. DAPL, or Dakota Access Pipeline, exemplifies how violence is used to interfere with the connections between lands and peoples. Simply put, the violent taking of the lands is related to violence against people and vice versa. The connection between land and violence is particularly salient when it's driven by what we have called the four P's, progress, profit, protection, and possession. DAPL highlights how controlling people and space are achieved through violence, although we will emphasize later, I'll emphasize later in this talk that it's not just physical violence, but other multiple forms of violence, cultural, political, social, and the ideological. And I want to make the point that the linkages between belonging, land, and violence seen at Standing Rock is neither new nor the most recent incident of this. The point of starting with DAPL is to point to one of the more highly visible cases where territory is in full bloom. DAPL is perfectly legal. What this battle highlights is a contestation over ways of thinking about, knowing about, and valuing land. This is a narrative of who belongs and who does not and under what conditions. It's also about who gets to write the story. When indigenous peoples reassert their presence as the many water protectors did in resisting the building of the pipeline, the police and private security forces responded with physical violence of erasure, attempting to remove protesters using dogs and water cannons in a conflict centered on the sacred and inherent value of water in addition to its vital importance in drinking and use by the Standing Rock peoples, water becomes weaponized as a violent force against demonstrators to protect the interest of corporations and property and money or profit to be gained from building the pipeline. The insidious gradual violence of contamination takes us a thousand miles east to Flint, Michigan. <clears throat> Flint is one of the largest cities in Michigan Located less than 70 miles from Detroit, the city was once a hub of the limited states of the United States auto industry, and one of the cities hit hardest by its collapse. Flint organized a company town for General Motors, originated as a company town for General Motors. The map on this slide is by the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation, a federal agency created in the New Deal to appraise home values and inform buyers. The map is wonderfully reconstructed by researchers at the University of Richmond. It offers a look at how white supremacy operates in city planning. Information provided by these maps was for white buyers, lenders, and borrowers of the quote-unquote character of the different neighborhoods, unquote. Warning the white buyer of the presence of poor whites, black, immigrant, and other deemed undesirable and neighborhood characteristics, areas in red are D, fourth grade, or hazardous, 
due to the population and include notes like, quote, undesirable, aliens and Negroes, end quote. Flint would grow with the auto industry and become a major city with a growing black population, but with the multiple economic recessions and decline of auto manufacturing, economic inequality grew as residential segregation became entrenched. This was exacerbated as city planning governed by corporate interest and white supremacy ensured white flight combined with redlining and demolition, sorry, demolition, attempted gentrification of black neighborhood and subsequent abandonment. Flint schools were not ordered to desegregate until 1975, and a plan installed in 1980 that failed to integrate schools or provide adequate resources for a rapidly growing black population. As historian Andrew R. Highsmith explained in his really lovely 2015 book on Flint, it's called um, Demolition Means Progress. Flint is representative of the dense webs of legal, popular, and administratively driven inequality that affects the U.S. And it is this context in the town, which is nearly 60% African American, with a, with a median income of $31,424, and almost 30% of the population living below the federal poverty line, that the water became poisonous. In the midst of the 20, uh, 2008 and 9 recession, Flint officials attempted to save money by switching the city's water supply from Detroit water and sewerage and building an alternative pipeline, we're back to pipelines, to connect to the uh, Karen Gandhi Water Authority. While the pipeline was being built on April 25, 2014, the city switched to getting water from the Flint River without properly installing filters or anti-corrosion measures, deciding instead to wait and see what contaminations would arise. Flint residents immediately began filing official complaints about the water supply, and in August of 14, E. coli <clears throat> and total coliform bacteria were detected, beginning an, beginning an advisory for residents to boil water. But by then, the pipes throughout the city had already begun to corrode at a rapid rate. Yet again, we see a drive for profit and possession rear their ugly heads at the expense of brown peoples. By January of 2015, Flint was found to be in violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act, and independent researchers began testing, tests showing poisonous levels of lead. The EPA limit for lead in drinking water is 15 parts per billion. In February of 15, researchers found lead contents of 104 parts per billion in the homes of Flint residents. This is seven, sorry, this is seven times the highest limit. By September of 15, the city issued a lead advisory to the city, to itself and its residents, while in October of that same year, the city switched back to its original water supply. The damage and corrosion to the water pipes had been done, and the presence of lead and poisons leaching from the pipes into the city's drinking water became a constant struggle. After declaration of a state of emergency by Flint's mayor, Michigan's governor, and President Obama, the e and the EPA issued an emergency order to take action. Criminal charges were filed against state officials, lawsuits against corporations, and plans to repair the waterways began, notably using phosphates and additives that would help clean the pipes and rebuild corrosion they aren't working because the Flint residents stopped using inst the water so it no longer runs. So the pipes continue to be poisonous. Now it's June of 2019 and Flint, Michigan still doesn't have clean drinking water. Its children and its future are suffering from lead poisoning that impacts their ability to learn, socialize, think, and be healthy. They are slowly being poisoned by the government, and their plight has largely been ignored by policymakers and politicians. They are being erased. As in Standing Rock, water becomes a tool of violence, a, syst a systemic, pervasive violence of manage mismanagement, segregation, and poverty. Communities in Flint continue to live without clean water, living with the historical violence of economic and racial oppression and the ongoing physical violence of lead poisoning, their, their water supply. 
The fact that the decontamination additives that would potentially help to clear the water become less effective makes sense of the ways that the fears also, also made solutions impractical. Why would the people of Flint trust the same city that caused the water pollution in the first place? That the water is then safe to use. Instead, residents continue to use bottled water for everything from drinking to bathing because of the contamination. From the bottles of water in Flint, I want to move towards our home state of Arizona, where the state flagrantly destroys bottled water that can mean the difference between life and death in the Sonoran Desert. Sonoran Desert, as you all know, is a beautiful place. I love the fact that it blooms with bright fly flowers after winter and spring rains. It's filled with wildlife and vegetation much of it within the traditional homelands of the Oatham peoples of both the U.S. and Mexico. It sits within and along the border of the U.S. and Mexico. As such, there are people, both U.S. citizens and citizens of other places, who use the space to move between different communities and countries. This has been true for millennia, except that the countries being moved between were indigenous ones. Over the past 20 years, U.S. Border Patrol estimates more than 7,000 people have crossed the border through the Sonoran Desert. The Pima Medical Examiner reported that between 2012 and 15, almost 600 bodies were, were recovered of people crossing the border, with the majority cause of death being exposure to the elements and dehydration. Because there is flow of human and animal traffic between the U.S. and Mexico, and because they believe not having access to water will deter people from traveling the lands. The U.S. Border Patrol agents have made it a practice to destroy water left out for those who may be crossing the border. I am really, really keenly aware of the fact that there's been some interesting developments on this campus between people speaking out and the U.S. Border Patrol. Just, just to be clear, it doesn't sort of leave my mind as I say this and talk about it. Two humanitarian nonprofit groups, No More Death, No Mas Muertes, and uh, the Coalition for Human Rights released a report in January of 2018 that Border Patrol agents would intentionally destroy gallons of water left out to help prevent dehydration and heat-related illnesses among people crossing the border. The report estimated that, that over 3,500 gallons of water were destroyed either intentionally by dumping it, the water, slashing, stabbing, kicking, draining, or confiscating the water that was left among well-known migrant routes in the Arizona desert. The same report found that blankets, food, and other supplies left out as humanitarian aid were destroyed, including puncturing food, making it unusable by migrants so that it would rot and spoil. Hidden camera footage shows Border Patrol agents dumping water into the desert and laughing. Shortly after the report was released, Border Patrol raided a site known as the barn, where migrants could receive food, water, and fresh clothes, and limited medical care with no questions asked about their status. The arrestee, there was someone arrested in this case, a guy named Scott Warren. You all probably been watching this in the news. It's a faculty associate at Arizona State, as it turns out, was charged with felony alien smuggling. His case resulted just, I think it was yesterday, um, or the day before, in the hung jury and mistrial, meaning the prosecution will get to decide whether to try the case again. The Border Patrol and many of those who support them are driven by the idea that they are doing their jobs to protect the U.S. from individuals who are not coming to the U.S. legally. They are removing life-sustaining resources as a way to deter those who might use these resources to survive as they move from one place to the next. I'm not interested at this point in um, having a conversation about immigration. I think that it is absolutely um, important, but I'm much more interested at the moment in engaging an underlying notion of who belongs and what narratives are being told about the process. Under the guise of law and order, the stories of these people who are coming to the U.S. are alighted. The only narrative really being addressed and allowed to emerge in the U.S. is a country of laws. How do we make sense of the fact that the U.S. has also traditionally been a country of refuge, where peoples come to begin new lives? 
How do we make sense of the idea that we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us? In this context, to demonstrate that history matters, how do we make sense of water being destroyed to create a sense of who belongs and who does not? And as water serving as a proxy for someone's worth and well-being and the gleeful destruction of, life -giving, of a life-giving resource in the desert is quite literally the difference between life or death. Yet again, the idea of protection and possession are at play at the expense of brown bodies. And I want to note again that it's all legal. So how do we make sense of these three examples as a group um, of educators who might be framed um, as diverse in the racialization and, and in the work that we are doing in teaching? As a group of individuals who cross a wide range of gender identities and class identities and the intersections of all of these things, the key point connecting all of these issues, these three issues that I've just talked about, bless you, is the interlock system of oppression namely white supremacy, which is where I started, which creates the laws and structures that enable, facilitate, or obfuscate these issues. These issues are isolated and put into silos to narrow the focus to particular space, race, or group. The context surrounding each example is important, but I want to draw close attention to the ways in which each of these issues are related um, to the ways in which the law, the state, and people operating within it facilitate violence, fear, and terror in each context, connecting these issues through what we have termed territory. Fear and terror are vital to the maintenance of white supremacy, particularly in the succinct way that Ruth Wilson Gilmore defines racism as, and I'm quoting Professor Gilmore here, the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, end quote. In other words, the law makes white supremacy functional, actual, and seemingly perpetual. In a society where people, namely African Americans, are kidnapped and enslaved, were treated as property, the transfer of lands into a system of property necessitated the dispossession of those lands from indigenous peoples. This happened through law, but importantly, it is made real by fear and violence. And in these cases, the law makes terror possible. We should begin to consider a moment in which we remove silos to show that structural connections between network depressions. The, this image is a little bit of an is a lot of an oversimplification, but the point to under, but it's the point for it is to underscore how white supremacy links these regions at the margins. This is not to say that people should not focus or lose focus on local struggles. These are crucial and they're important. But forming and showing connections between these issues highlights a larger structural network of issues that reminds us that we cannot succeed alone. I want to suggest that focusing on a phenomenon rather than on a, on a single racial or ethnic group is one way to address the ravages of silos attached to the maintenance of white supremacy. Working solely in one area or region or with one racial or ethnic or racial group without connection to other struggles allows the structural violence of white supremacy, which is linked to patriarchy, colonization, and capitalism, to repair itself and facilitate the oppression of others. In other words, a singular victory against white supremacy is more likely to be short-lived if it is not connected to the larger structures and the geographies that they encompass. I don't want to caution against enjoying the victories as they come. They are rare, it seems, because especially in times like these, any successful action against oppression must be applauded. But as we continue in this work, the coalition of conscience, the network of connectivity, is crucial. So my purpose here is not only to expose the relationship between issues uh, uh, that highlight these systemic um, issues, I think if we look across our fields, across our disciplines, whatever it is we teach, across the students that we work with, whether they're primary or secondary students, or even those who are teaching college students, we'll find that we can all share examples of how white supremacy through territory and other means has systematically created vulnerabilities, exploitation, oppression, and marginalization. In making these connections, we highlight that these are not isolated incidents, 
but as educators, we can also play a part in the coalition of peoples to create wide ranging, massive interventions to examine the natural, social, and humanistic sciences surrounding the imbricated issues of race, justice, violence, water, and well being. We do this as educators by linking the issues in a systemic, bless you, systematic way to not only study the issue and challenge, but also to create interventions. These interventions must be engaged in and enacted in ways that are systemic and structural, avoiding the silos that would have us ration justice. We also do this to rewrite and reframe the narratives to underscore narratives of belonging and humanity. What if we as educators and human beings, assuming we're both in this room, create coalitions of conscience? committed to highlighting the structural connections to our individual plights, but also create interventions. What if these interventions are driven by, with, and for the communities in which we work and live, and that the coalitions are not only between and within academics and educators, but also between and within school systems and communities in which we live and work? White supremacy relies on silos and isolation in order to function since solidarity and collaboration are the antithesis of white supremacy. Whiteness co-ops, assimilates, and it consumes. I got ahead of myself. If we're going to humanize education through transforming curriculum, then we need to transform the work we do, not as a group of individuals, but as a coalition of peoples committed to creating a more just, humane society where our children can grow up knowing that their government or water or systems will not limit or hinder them, that it will not poison them to, or, or be used to hurt them or withheld to kill them. Instead, society and its concomitant structures will enable, strengthen, and enhance their abilities to grow into their best selves. We can build strength and pride in individual groups and coalitions of conscience by focusing on the importance of shared experiences around particular phenomena. In the, in the case of this talk, it is about water, although, although I would argue that it is fundamentally about who belongs, where, and to what end. Imagine a focused group of educators turning webs of oppression into webs of opportunities. We can and should be humanizing education. Thank you. <laughs>